Video with the archives. And this is the Wise Sage project that we are creating. We have lots of ministers and friends that we are part that are participating in this program. Today we have the pleasure of having Dr. John Waterhouse. He is the co-founding minister, along with his wife, Dr. Barbara Waterhouse, in Asheville, North Carolina. Dr. John, we would like to know all about you, beginning with your siblings and your family, and what brought you into Science of Mind? I can tell you that story. I've told it many times. Thank you, Dr. Leo. It's, a, it's an honor to have this time with you and to do this recording. So uh, my, the, here's how my story generally goes. I was born in, uh, in Miami, Florida uh, in 1953. I, had, I was the oldest of four children in my family. Uh, we were raised Southern Baptist. My mother was from Asheville, North Carolina, where I live now. And my father was from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And they, they both grew up Baptist, so that's how we grew up. And uh, I followed the tenets of the Baptist Church through my youth and uh, was a youth leader in the Baptist Church and uh, participated in lots of ways. Uh, but when I went off to, uh, to college and became uh, more interested in girls than, uh, than religion, I, I kind of faded away from that. Uh, and when I was 19, I moved to Houston Excuse me. When I was 19, uh, I'm, I was still living in Florida, but it wasn't long after that. No, maybe I was 19 when I moved to Houston. Yeah, I think I was. And I had followed a woman out there. Uh, I gave up college to follow her out there, and uh, we ended up getting married, and, and uh, I had a son with her. She was raised uh, Roman Catholic, so all the more reason not to uh, focus much on religion. Uh, and uh, after a time... I guess we were we were married for 13 years, but at about 11 years, I believe, um, uh, my the business that I had created in Houston, uh, which was an oil field equipment business named after me, it was called Waterhouse Engine and Pump Company. Uh, I uh, uh, the the industry kind of fell apart in the oil field industry, so so did mine, my business, and um, about that time, my uh, my marriage failed as well. And my uh, wife and my young son moved back to Miami, and I had the choice of following them down there or running away from home. So I chose running away from home, and I moved to Sydney, Australia. That's as far away as I could figure I could get. You know, most people think if you drill a hole straight through the earth from, from the United States that you would be in China. That's not true. You would actually be in Australia. So that was as far away. And uh, it took me all of three days being in uh, uh, Sydney, Australia, that I met my first real spiritual teacher. And his name was Ken Dyers. He had a uh, community there in downtown Sydney, which I became very involved with. Uh, learned a lot about this whole idea of being uh, a, a non-physical being using a physical body. And his uh, origination came from uh, Zen Buddhism. And Scientology. He had left the Church of Scientology and they were quite angry with him, uh, but he had learned what he needed to and moved on. And he was an extraordinary teacher and I'm deeply blessed to have had him in my life. Uh, after being there for about a year, I moved back to the United States. And uh, uh, my mom had called me when I was down there and said that my son was in trouble. He was probably seven by then. And uh, so I moved back down to Miami to support him and uh, moved back in with my mom, which was <laughs> quite an experience. Um, I love my mom, and, and, but she's got some, you know, some of those uh, ideas that older people uh, generally have, you know, generational uh, disconnect. But I loved her very much, and so for a short time, I, I uh, cohabitated with her, but it took me all of three days, uh, dropping her off at work and, and using her car during the day. The third day I was back in Miami, I was driving down Miller Road in South Miami, and I, a building that I'd passed a thousand times, probably more than that in my life, had never noticed it, never paid attention. It had two signs out in front of it. One said, Center for Positive Living. That one didn't interest me at all. Uh, the other one said, Science of Mind. And so the, it was almost like the car pulled itself into the parking lot. And I went inside the office, and a woman came out from the back, and I said, I asked her, 
after our, you know, we got, I said hello to one another. I said, so what is science of mind? And I have to be honest, I don't remember what she said that day, uh, but she did invite me to come on Sunday, which I did. And in, in my way of doing things, I sat on the front row and became very much in love with this philosophy very, very quickly. Uh, it, it was, I don't want to say it was a perfect match, but it was the same language I, I had learned in Australia the year before. So with a very uh, uh, excited heart, I jumped in whole hog and got very involved. Uh, one of the first things that happened to me at that church was that they had invited a guest to come, a guest consultant to come to work with the board at that church. Uh, his name was Marty Lapata, and uh, Marty had been the uh, uh, the chairman of the board at the Huntington Beach Church with Peggy Bassett. And he was there to, to kind of spur on this community in Miami and uh, was talking to a group of people kind of on the side after the service and uh, trying to recruit people to start what he called uh, the Outrageous Committee. And he said it would be a committee that would liven things up and do Sunday announcements and, and really keep things exciting around there. And the people that were he was talking to all kind of backed off and said, and that doesn't sound like something I want to do. And I stepped right into their, into their little conversations that I'll do it. And I, that was my first job at that church. I was the chair of the outrageous committee and we did some marvelous things. We, uh, uh, we did Sunday announcements. There was an annual event that people paid to come to, uh, at a country club. And, uh, uh, we did those announcements. I, uh, we went up on stage, and I had my uh, my committee stand there with uh, placards that were turned backwards, so you couldn't see what they read. And and I said things. And this was this was in 1984. So uh, the, uh, I said to them, "Okay, well, uh, now is your chance uh, to really uh, uh, step up and be a part of this wonderful event. It's it's a reasonable price, especially when we have Frank Sinatra as our our guest." Our, our special entertainment and the first person turned over their sign and said, he's lying. We have, and whoever was there was the name on the card. And uh, the next one uh, uh, said something like I, I, at the microphone, I said, uh, and if you, if you sign up today, we'll pick you up in a, in a uh, stretch limo that day. And the sign went around and said, no, you've got to get yourself there. And it went on like that. For, the, for the, the laughing of it. And then the next week was, we were probably right at the end of the campaign to get people to come. And we had a parade through the sanctuary. We had, uh, I remember someone was on a skateboard. Someone was on a unicycle. Someone was hauling somebody in a wheelbarrow. And they all traipsed through this, uh, the, the center and went out the center aisle. And I went up to the mic and said, doesn't matter how you get there, but get to our special event. And that was my announcement that day. And then the other one, the, the, the other announcement that really sticks out was for a work day where we were going to work in the gardens. And what I did was I went out into the gardens and I, I pulled up a, a, a weed, a big, large weed, and I potted it in a plant and I put it up under the, uh, uh, the podium on the stage. And when it came time for my announcement, I went up there and I pulled this out and I said, this is, is a miracle of God, that from one tiny seed, this plant could come forth using the earth and the sunshine and the, and the rain and, and build itself into this magnificent uh, specimen. And on Saturday, we're going to go out into the garden and we're going to pull all these out and throw them away. And so we had a good, good work day after that. So that was my beginning. Very quickly, they invited me onto the, onto the board. And uh, then I went to our senior minister, uh, whose name was Tony Bonacorso. And, and I said, Tony, what you really need at this church is an administrator. And he listened to me very politely, and he said, John, we're not going to do that. And I said, okay. So I just held it in, in what I had, was learning, spiritual mind treatment, because I was in class every Monday night. Uh, and about two weeks later, the president of the board came to me and said, John, you know what we really need at this center is an administrator. We think it should be you. So I became the administrator of that church. Uh, and not long after that, uh, um, Tony and his wife, Barbara, left the Miami church uh, under some challenging things. There were, there were people that weren't pleased with their style, although they were very effective in their work, and uh, I love them very dearly. And uh, uh, what happened was when they left, I became the one pretty much running the place until Dr. Bill Hart uh, came to Miami as an interim minister. And Bill was an amazing person, and I, I learned so much from him. 
probably the most important thing was is that that uh, uh, you have to be genuinely interested in this philosophy to get the benefits of it. And what was happening during that time was I was being a bit of a rebel. My ministers had left. And although he was a wonderful man, uh, I would do my morning announcements on stage and then I would sneak out and go into the kitchen because we always had a luncheon uh, in the afternoon afterwards. And after two or three weeks of that, he sat me down. He said, John, I want you to understand that uh, what's happening here uh, is having an impact. Uh, with you getting up and leaving the sanctuary, uh, you're missing out on what we're doing and, and the, the lesson that comes forth. And frankly, it hurts my feelings that you're not in the room. So we have a rule at our center now. There are never any activities that go on during that celebration. Everybody is in the room together, other than the small children who have their time together, and they come in and cheer with us at the end. But that was such a good lesson for me, and I really just adored him. He actually had the, uh, the original recording of, the, of, the, uh, of Dr. Holmes' speech at the uh, um, uh, Harmony Center. And he was the one that introduced Dr. Holmes that night. And he let me listen to that uh, with goosebumps and tears in my eyes. Um, so there was no way that I wasn't moving forward in this teaching. Uh, and along the way, while Dr. Hart was there, uh, he had a need, need to go back to California for, for a business, his personal business. And during that time, we had a guest speaker coming to the center, something that had been set up for a long time. Uh, Terry Cole Whitaker came to speak to us. And uh, this was in November, I want to say 1988. And um, uh, Terry came and I was her host because I was still the ranking member when Bill wasn't around. And uh, so I, I uh, met Terry and, and, we, and we planned the day and she gave a wonderful workshop uh, at that time. This was on Sunday afternoon. And at the time I was giving uh, a class, actually. It was an, a, a non-licensed uh, license class. You didn't get anything for it. But uh, I had a class going on Sunday night. Uh, and uh, I went to, uh, um, well, I haven't, I haven't really shared something important here. The woman that came out from the back. Uh, she's my wife now, uh, and that was Reverend uh, Barbara Bonacorso at the time. And uh, so she had come back to the church. She and Tony both came back to hear Terry speak that day because they really set that up with Terry, uh, although it was sponsored by one of the ministers. And so what happened that day was is that uh, after her workshop, I introduced her at the workshop. She did a fabulous workshop. She was staying at the Fountain Blue Hotel. Uh, and I, afterwards, I, I knew that there was a small gathering. There were a meeting at the Fountain Blue for dinner. And I went to uh, a Reverend Barbara, and I said to her, I would love to be able to come to dinner uh, with Terry and all of you. And Barbara said, no, I don't think that would work. Uh, and I said, okay. And about five minutes later, the woman that had paid for Terry to be there uh, came up to me and said, John, we're going to dinner at the Fountain Blue. Would you like to come? And I said, I would love to come. So I came, and we sat at a great big round table in one of the main dining rooms at the Fountain Blue. And uh, it, uh, the, the arrangement ended up with Terry to my left, uh, her daughter Suzanne to her left, and to my right was Barbara and then uh, Reverend Tony and, and whoever else was with us that day or that evening. And we had a lovely dinner. And at some point during the dinner, uh, Terry turned to me, and she said, John, what can I do for you? Uh, it didn't take me long, uh, just a moment, to say, well, you could ordain me into ministry. And she said, okay, get down on your knees. So I moved my chair, and I got down on my knees. And she picked up her, her uh, butter knife, and she tapped me on each shoulder, and she said, I ordain you St. John the Divine. And I sat back up in my seat, and I looked at her, and I said, you know, that was real. And she said, I know. And I turned around to Barbara who had been in ministry, in active ministry for over five years, and never at that time you were invited in, to be ordained, and had never been ordained. And I looked at Barbara, and I said, just ask her. And I pushed my chair back. And Barbara, who does not show emotions publicly, very seldom, was all choked up. But she got out the words, Terry, would you ordain me? And Terry said, come here. And she, she got down on her knees, and Terry put her hand right on top of her head, and, and Barbara's hair is very curly, and, and kind of ruffled up her curls and said, I ordain you, Barbara. 
and and Barbara got back up and sat down. And her her head was spinning, and uh, it was a lovely evening that changed all our lives. And what I heard later from Terry was that she and her daughter Suzanne were going back to their room at the Hilton at the uh, the uh, Fountain Blue, and Suzanne said to uh, uh, Terry, "Do you think Tony knows about John and Barbara?" And Terry laughed. Terry's the one who told me this story. Terry laughed and said, I don't think John and Barbara know about John and Barbara yet. And she was right. So this was Sunday. On Monday, I called Barbara and I said, we have to plan a party. We just got ordained. Uh, and she said, great. So on Wednesday, we went out to lunch at a lovely restaurant in Miami that was called Savannah Moon. And we sat across the table. <sighs> And fell in love. And of course, this was problematic because Barbara was married to Tony. So Barbara went off to figure out how to do this. And what she did was she went to see her mentor in, um, in Alabama, whose name, whose name is Edwin Gaines. And she drove all the way from Miami to, to Alabama. And Tony was off in in California with his, his extended family out there. And uh, she drove up there and sat down with, with Edwin and told her what had happened. And Edwin said, you fool, you go back to Miami and tell Tony. And so she came back and she came, she told me, she said, okay, I'm going to tell Tony that I'm leaving him. And I said, you can't do that for what just happened. We don't even know what this means. And she said, it's not about you. It's just about fun. And so she did, and Tony was quite upset, but we got through it. And uh, um, it was about a year later in 1989, it was actually in 1989, that uh, Barbara and I uh, got married. And um, it, was, uh, it was a new life for me, and, and it, it, we, were, we knew we wanted to do something wonderful, we just didn't know what it was. Barbara was still very gun-shy about being in ministry. Uh, so we moved to Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, in 1990, and uh, stayed for a couple of years, thought it wasn't going to work out. We became involved with a local unity church and uh, uh, became very involved there and actually helped them raise the money to build a new sanctuary and, uh, and buy new land. And uh, so uh, uh, we were doing just fine there, but I always had this yearning for us to be back in, in religious science, although I had no idea how that would look. And it was in 1994, Christmas time, that we were down in the Florida Keys on vacation. Uh, it's doing a little fishing off of uh, what's called No Name Key. And Barbara looked at me and she said, okay, I'm ready. And I knew exactly what she meant, even though we hadn't talked about it in, as far as, for, for, for a very long time. I knew what she meant. So we came back and uh, let some friends know that we were going to meet. We, uh, uh, we took all the living room furniture out of our, our small country uh, farmhouse and put in folding chairs. Uh, we realized we needed to do bigger than we thought because we thought we'd sit around the coffee table, but then we had so many people saying they were coming, we knew we had to do something else. So we bought these 30 chairs at, at Office Depot, and I knew we were really doing this when Barbara started tearing off the tags, and so you couldn't return them. Uh, and so we met in that farmhouse for three months and named our community Center for Creative Living. We owned a single-wide mobile home on the property. And that was uh, uh, in, in somewhat decent shape for its age. And we had rented it out to, some, to a fa small family, a, a couple and their child. Uh, and they had been in it for a couple of years. And uh, uh, they moved out. They, they were saving to buy a home. So they bought their home. And we had this single wide mobile home. And I looked at it and I said, you know what? We could be in there. It would be better than our living room. So... We uh, tore the front of it off, we and people who came to our center, and we built a 30 by 30 multi-use room, which served us for everything that we did, classes, Sunday morning, uh, luncheons, everything. That's where we met in that space. And the, the uh, mobile home provided two small bathrooms. Uh, that was all we needed. And uh, uh, the upper level was open to the 30 by 30 room, and we called it the mezzanine. And we could fit... If people were sitting in the windowsills and on the stairs uh, at the mezzanine, uh, we could fit 109 people in that place. And it was most always full. And in fact, to the point where it was a little ridiculous, we couldn't grow. And uh, so four and a half years in, 
Uh, we were fi finally found a piece of property that would work. We had been looking for property, nothing worked. But we found a piece of property that was owned by two of our practitioners. And uh, I knew the first time I stepped on that land, that's where we were supposed to be because hmm, there was a single wide mobile home on it. <laughs> so they took the mobile home away. Uh, we broke ground. Uh, the way it worked was these two beautiful people sold us half of the property. It was four acres and uh, told us we had to go find financing for the other, for the other two. They sold us two and we, uh, uh, we, we had to pay for two. And that was right what we needed to do. And we found financing to, to not only do buy the land, but to build our sanctuary and a two story building uh, so that we would have classes, classrooms and offices and a social hall. And we did all of that uh, in, in uh, let's see, that would have been 1999 and moved into that facility in October of 1999. It took us 15 months from the time we purchased the land till we moved in. Uh, we would work all day Saturday with 30 or so volunteers, and then we would have Sunday back out in Cornfield, as we called it. And so we, we, we did that for all those months, and then finally we moved in, and it was glorious, and we were so happy. And uh, uh, we have been uh, growing and, and uh, uh, expanding who we are since then. We have since bought two more acres of property, built another two-story building. Uh, we have a wonderful space for our kids now. Uh, we have uh, another large classroom uh, that holds uh, uh, probably about 150 people, which is larger than what we started with. And, uh, and our community is solid and strong and clear. And uh, we're very thrilled about what we've been able to do in this period of time. Now, that's one story. If you want me to keep going, I'll talk about how I got into the movement itself. I can't, uh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, this, you know, this is a wonderful story. And I have a couple of questions that okay. I'd like to have you um, uh, insert here. Uh, one is uh, you are a uh, psychologist, is that correct? And you I, I have a PhD in organizational psychology. Okay, and when did that happen? Uh, Let me look on the wall. <laughs> that happened while we were still out in the cornfield. Uh, that so that would have been that would have been nineteen ninety six. Nineteen ninety six. Oh. I graduated. It was after you were married to Barbara. And oh, yes, we were married. Uh, and uh, when I got my, my doctorate, uh, my, my lead instructor in my doctorate was Barry, he Barry Heerman. I don't know if you've heard of him. No. He's, he's, I introduced him to, to Science of Mind, and uh, he's, he's one of the writers for Science of Mind magazine now oh. and uh, was a wonderful teacher. And he asked me one day, I was getting this PhD to be an organizational psychologist, and he said, why aren't you going into ministry with Barbara? And I gave him some really lame answer, but his question wouldn't leave me alone to where just three months later, I went to the community and I said, okay, I'm not, I'm not just here to support you all. I, I'm your minister. And everyone cheered, and it was a wonderful day. So that's how, that's how actually I took the role of, of, of co-founding minister with Barbara. Okay, um, well, uh, just uh, share with us, because we have been connected here for about 30 minutes, so. Oh, no. <laughs> no, time does fly by, doesn't it, when you're having fun. But, so I would like to know, um, I know you're still extremely active, um, both of you, in, uh, in your church, in a very successful church, and so um, are you active in the community, uh, you know, is the church uh, active in, in your community? I know that your address is a Science Science of Mind Way. Is that what correct? The, this wonderful. You have your our, own. our home is one Science of Mind Way, and our and the center is two Science of Mind Way. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, so you've created your own little community right there. All right. Uh, so tell me, um, in in your own words, where do you think Science of Mind itself is going? Uh, in the future for the for the the Amer for America and for the world and uh, just tell us you know in your own mind how you think science of mind can be utilized and what we can do to spread the word and what what lovely words you have for us well the world's changing but the truth is in, in the same way 
that Ernest Holmes said that this was uh, the next iteration of the human experience, uh, I, I believe absolutely he was right. It just may not look the way he thought it was going to look. Certainly, there's nothing that I know that compares with spiritual community in, in creating the fellowship and the connection and all of the blessings that come from that. But we have to reach further than that. And many other people in the world have done that, great writers, uh, teachers uh, that are not directly connected to our organization have done great things in the world to, uh, to touch lives. They, uh, uh, and, and in some cases, more lives than our organization has. So we need new platforms, new ways to reach out into the world. And I think we've found one here in Asheville. Uh, and it's not a surprise. Every, most every center has a website. But the way we structured our website, we get a lot of attention because we put all of our Sunday talks, we have, I don't know how many, probably seven, 800 Sunday talks, Sunday messages on our website. We have uh, a number of, of classes on our website that are available for anyone to watch. We have every book we could find that was, that was published before uh, copyright laws went into effect, so they're in public domain. We have, have had them uh, uh, placed up, uploaded onto our website. Anyone can download them, read them. Barbara has audio taped several uh, other books, and we really reach out into the world, and we don't charge people for this. We invite people to support our ministry, but, but we don't charge anything. That would be like charging people at the front door here. It doesn't work. And because of that, we get a lot of people coming to our website. Uh, in an, uh, uh, last month, yes, last month, we had 150, over 115,000 pages opened up on our website. And the average time that an individual viewer will spend on our website is over 20 minutes. And even though they're not getting the human connection of us, they're experiencing the science of mind through, through this all over the world. We have, we have groups that, that meet all across Central and South America, uh, in uh, China, India, um, strangely, Bulgaria often comes up as one of the top countries. France, Canada, all these countries uh, have people that come to our website and, and, and receive the, the, the wisdom that we have to share. And I think more centers need to do that kind of work rather than trying to monetize their website. You can ask, and people will, some people will support you, and that's enough to make it work. So, uh, John, what is your website name? Is it Our website address is CSL Asheville, and that's A-S-H-E-V-I-L-L-E -L -L -E mm -hmm. dot org. Wonderful. Thank you yeah. very much. Okay. It's a beautiful website. We're very proud of it. And I look forward to uh, visiting that. So in conclusion, which I hate for this to end because it's, it's so interesting. You are so interesting. But we do have to kind of... I understand. All right. So would you please give, in just a few words, to our audience, words of encouragement, of inspiration for the future, for our future. Thank you. What I would say to anyone who is searching for the truth of themselves is look inside, all the answers are there. You just have to be still enough and trusting enough to know that the presence of the divine dwells wholly and completely, infinitely, as Thomas Durd said, with, at every point, which includes their point, the point of each of us. And that when we recognize that in ourselves, it changes everything. And when we recognize it in ourselves, we're ready to recognize it in everyone else. And when you know that, you can live that life of the beloved and, and continue touching others with that, with that wonderful knowing. Thank you. Thank you so very much. For My great pleasure. Yes.